You're listening to the Angry Marks Podcast Network. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Stevie J from AngryMarks.com, joined by a very special guest. This is Emerson Whitner of WrestlingOutsiders.com and AngryMarks.com and F4WOnline.com. And I'm sure I still have a MySpace page somewhere, too. Yes, indeed. And also, you can find me a few other places. You can find me at Wrestling Observer, where you may have read my interview with Scott Phoenix this week, or my interview with Jim Ross a few weeks ago. But anyway, that's not what we're here to talk about. We're not here to do cheap plugs. This isn't Mick Foley's podcast. We're not doing cheap pops either. This is the NXT TakeOver Report from Dallas, Texas. So let's start with the pre-show. Emerson, your thoughts? I was a big fan of... uh... Andrade, uh, he beat Chris Gerard in the dark match. They were filming it, so who knows? It might end up on NXT next week, or you know, it might just be lost in the ether. Yes, but and and let's clarify that Manny Andrade. I couldn't think of his first name. Right, but we're talking about uh, uh, Biff Busick and La Sombra from Mexican wrestling luchador fame, and Biff Busick from Top Rope Promotions, home of Taylor Hendricks and Matt Taven. Indeed, indeed. So, yes, a, a, a bonus match opener, but uh, I think a lot of the crowd was uh, a little confused by the match if they weren't hardcore followers of the NXT live house show circuit. Mm -hmm. I, it, was, it wasn't very long, maybe three or four minutes. Um, I actually have never seen Andrade wrestle. In fact, up until this mor or this evening, I thought it was Andrade. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but it was a really fun match. Uh Gerard is pretty good. Um, is he signed? I don't know. I think he is signed to NXT Developmental. Okay. I, I'm pretty sure. And I know Andrade is. Because a lot of times it's hard to remember who actually is signed and who isn't. Right. That's actually a debate I had with the fans sitting in front of me. It's like all these fly-by-night guys that are great and come in and do shows and then aren't full-time. Guys like Tommaso Ciampa and James Storm. You know, there's a lot of guys that are that seem like NXT has an open-door policy. Like, we'll let you come in and work a few. T oh, yeah. I just kind of ruined my own comment here. NXT reminds me a lot of the early days of TNA where they basically gave anybody a shot on the show. And if you hit, great. And if you didn't, oh, well, we'll never see you again. Mm. Or in some cases, in four years' time, you have the WrestleMania main event against Triple H. Yes, indeed. And sometimes you go from working Bound for Glory to working the main event of NXT TakeOver, but we're not quite there yet. So let's move on to the second match of the pre-show, which I believe was originally scheduled for the broadcast. No, it wasn't. Um, or maybe, like, if it was one of those things where if they had time, it would be added. But it was Apollo Crews and the drifter Elias Sampson. Samson got more heat than he's ever gotten in his life. Yes, the building was lit up and ready to take it out on somebody, and Elias Samson got the brunt of it big time. This is not the normal Elias Samson. Nobody reacts to him, and he still tells us to shut up crowd. This was the we don't want to see you, please leave crowd. This was the Vicky Guerrero shut the hell up and go away reaction. Oh, uh, and Apollo Crews came out. This match went quite a while, like... I don't have a stopwatch. Dave probably has it timed in his head. It was probably a good 12, 13 minutes. I was going to say 15, so I'm in the same ballpark. Yeah, and I'm not saying like a 13, 15 minute match is long by any stretch of the imagination, but for a dark match that you may never see again, that's a long dark match. Yeah, well, there was definitely a period in that when Samson had the heat where I was like, oh, God, please make the comeback already. I um, if I'm sitting here next Wednesday talking about this match, I'll be sp I'll be spending too much time talking about the parallel universe of me sitting in the crowd watching it and sitting at home watching it too. <laughs> yes, I don't think I need to see it again. Although I was happy that uh, Uha Nation, Apollo Cruz, whatever we're calling him now, I was happy to see him win, even if it was a dark match. Indeed, indeed, indeed. Uh, so moved on to Takeover, and one of the the biggest question in my mind going into the show was, was Triple H going to open the show like he always doesn't take over? The answer is no, actually. Yeah, I was a little thrown off by that, to be honest. I expected him to come out and do the, we are NXT. I, I was sure he was going to do that. Um, I should point out, not for not that anybody I believe really cares, but the NXT TakeOver pre-show was actually taped a good 45 minutes to an hour before it actually aired on the network, and if the camera was up a little higher, 
you would have seen my smiling face peeking out from behind. Now, in that same area, I noticed later, because I was looking back over there towards where you were, and I noticed the Iron Sheik was sitting there. I did not see Sheiky Baby. Yes, he was. He was in a wheelchair. He had somebody pushing him around. Lady J can confirm this. Wow. Yeah. And during that Samson match, I said, Honky Tonk Man called and he wants his guitar back. <laughs> That's right, you did. <laughs> About five minutes uh, before they stopped taping it, because they had the TV there and the little clock in the corner of the screen, um, I moved over because I noticed a row of empty seats right against the guardrail. And I'm like, hey, at the very least, you know, I'll see how long I last. Turns out I lasted the first two matches, but uh, as people came over right before the tag title match, which, speaking of which, opened the show, American Alpha uh, versus The Revival for the tag team titles. I don't know why, but I hate the name The Revival. It just sounds so horribly forced and made up. Like, well, the crowd definitely had the right reaction to The Revival because they, they took it out on them big time and said, which one are you? Which yeah. one are you? And, you know, Scott Dawson, like, he's had a lot of gimmicks. He's had a lot of partners. You know, again, I'm the only person who watches NXT every single bloody week for the last six years. But, you know, he's been through a lot, so it was nice to see him actually get a little bit of a push here. But Jordan and Gable, when Jordan was teaming with Ty Dillinger, man, oh, man, was that just the suckiest bunch of sucks. And... <laughs> But Gable is the man, and, and the crowd treated him like he was the man. They they sang the Kurt Angle theme song for him tonight. Yep. I don't know if he's going to become the next Kurt Angle, but I think he really should be given the chance to. Mm -hmm. he, can, he can wrestle like it. He can suplex like it. He can, mm -hmm. He's got the agility, the ability, the speed, the power, and he's got the amateur wrestling background to put it all together, and he looks ready right now. The thing is, I don't think Jason Jordan by himself would will do anything. Jordan on his own would unfortunately be in trouble. Without Chad Gable, he would be lost. And I don't know if you know, because Gable never even had a singles match. So who knows, maybe Gable wouldn't work out as a single. But this was a fine little opener. Um, it was expected, in my mind, to be the worst match on the show. And I mean, come on, when you have matches the caliber of the three main events it's really not a dig mm -hmm. but it did in fact live up to its expectations it was the weakest of the five main show matches and yet it got a really really good reaction at the gay bailey people were into this indeed um by the way how packed was it up where you were sitting because like it seemed like for a while there was a lot of empty seats well during the pre-show there were still empty seats but i'd say by the time the opener started there were almost no seats in our area okay um so then we got uh, austin aries versus baron corbin now see i would have actually said this was the weakest match of the entire card this was th i mean i like the finish to a degree but it's not the finish that i want aries to get in a win i'm just happy he won but it just, uh, just roll-up finishes in general, uh, no, and Baron Corbin having the heat for a long time, no. It's just There's just things about it that just didn't thrill me. It wasn't terrible, but it wasn't great. We actually got a lot of, maybe not roll-up finishes, but a lot of roll-ups on general in the show. And specifically in that tag title match, I forgot to mention, they had a nice series towards the finish of just one roll-up after another, after another, after another. And the sad thing is, the crowd all bought at least most of them as the actual finish well see at least in the tag match it came off like chain wrestling like one thing to the next to the next to the next whereas in the aries corbin match it just kind of came out of nowhere out of the blue like really that's how we're finishing this it was an interesting way for Cor uh, for aries debut match like i remember when they made the match i'm like this makes sense because corbin's the anti-internet wrestler guy but it's like, wow, it's not the best showcase for Austin Aries and his abilities. Right, and he tried. I mean, he did some stuff specifically with the crowd in mind when he would do the running flying moves off the apron to the floor. He was he was doing stuff for the fans to try to get them back into it, and I think it worked, but only to a limited degree. We then got a beating. Yeah, that would be a way to put it. We got a match that will be difficult for anyone to live up to at WrestleMania. 
Shinsuke Nakamura versus Sami Zayn. Um, up leading up to this match, I was telling everybody that the two of them could break both of their legs in the middle of the ring, botch every single move they try, and I will still sit there and say that it was the match of the year. Now, before you go any further, you mentioned botching. There was a botchamania chant. Uh, remind me, which one of the matches? Was that the opener? I'll be honest, I didn't understand half of the chants, so... Well, I know there was a botchamania chant. I think it was during American Alpha and the Revival. Couldn't tell you why, though. Maybe, because I was probably thinking they were chanting for gotch, and <laughs> no, it was I couldn't botch. figure it out. It, it was definitely botchamania, because I said to the people in front of me, that made Matthew's night, and they both started laughing. <laughs> Um, so we got Shinsuke Nakamura, Sami Zayn. I have to watch that on tape. I'm not going to give the big five-star argument here. But in the building, it sure felt like a five-star match. In the building, it felt like this is a match you need to go out of your way to see. Like, I hope it came across on TV nearly as great as it came across live. Um... I'm a huge Nakamura mark, I'm a huge Sami Zayn mark, and these two worked as well together as you expect. I don't know if they've ever wrestled before, I doubt it, to be honest, but could be wrong. Um, and this was strong style, this was not, you know, WWE safe style for this match. These two men beat the holy living bleep out of each other. Yes, it was strong style in the strongest sense of the word. Everything Nakamura did to put heat on Zayn was kicks and punches and beatings. Yep. And I, after about 10, 15 minutes, I was thinking, like, oh my god, like, I started getting worried with, like, Sami Zayn being healthy for WrestleMania. Right. And Michelle said these guys really know how to sell a beating. Yeah. A beating was the operative word of this because they made it look physically tough on each other. Uh, Sami Zayn was blocking Nakamura's kicks with his head. <laughs> yes. Um, Which made his hope spots even better because it would look like he was completely out of it and then he would reverse Nakamura into a slam or a clothesline or a move to the outside. And he'd be like, oh my god, he's not dead. And it's possible he was kind of out of it. <laughs> Sami Zayn went for his... I really need to find out a better way to describe this. Everyone knows the move I'm talking about. But he starts hitting the other side of the, of the floor, runs across the floor, dives up over the bottom uh, rope and goes for a trainer of DDT... But in this case, Nakamura kicked him in the head. <laughs> and that got a genuine holy shit reaction. Yep. Like, I took a picture, I, was, I took a flash to take the picture of him coming over for the DDT, and instead I got a picture of Nakamura kicking him in the head. Nice timing, I yes. like that. Um, this was just, this will be on my DVD for a very long time. I will be saving this match watching it again and again and again. You know when they make another edition of NXT's Greatest Matches, this match is on there. If this match isn't on it, we got problems. <laughs> yes, yes. And for the record, Shinsuke Nakamura won this match. Have we even said who the winners were in all these matches? Um, Austin Aries won, American Alpha won the tag belts, um, and Shinsuke Nakamura. And this shouldn't really be a surprise because Sami Zayn, I think, has won one match ever on TakeOver. <laughs> I don't think yeah. I'm exaggerating when I say that. And that was that like, awesome. like the one where he won the title. That might yes. be the only one ever. Yes. Because uh, I'm serious because he lost to Cesaro. He lost uh, to Tyler Breeze when they did that awesome finish. We went with a Luva kick and Breeze ducked and headbutted Zayn in the groin. Um, he lost the four-way. He beat Neville and he lost to Owens twice. Mm -hmm. and, That's it. That's absolutely it. And that it is a testament to how good of a worker... El Generico slash Sami Zayn is that he is that over even though he loses more than he wins. People love he, the heck out of him. He is a lovable person. Like, he is the non-messed up Jeff Hardy. Mm -hmm. Like, I honestly think he can reach, like, that level, if not higher, you know. If they give him the chance to, if they let him be himself and go out there and have great matches, yes. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, uh, Nakamura wins. At some point, I believe Kota Ibushi was there. They showed him. Scott Hall and X-Pac were there in the crowd. 
Stephanie got a standing boo when she was there before the women's match. And we'll get to the big one before, you know, the main event. But then we got poor placement, by the way, I'd like to say. Bailey versus Asuka. Because after watching Zayn and Nakamura level each other for 20 minutes, it just looked... Uh, and it, it, I feel so horrible for saying this. It looked weak mm -hmm. to watch Bailey and Oscar exchange moves. Well, I'm going to say you and I had different seating. You were on the floor. I was up in the risers. So from my perspective, it didn't look weak at all. It looked like Asuka was killing her. At, well, Bailey's offense looked weak. Let me just... All say. right. That, that's fair. I'll accept that argument. But... I, I actually thought it was okay if it did because the idea was to get Asuka over as this merciless killing machine from Japan who has a litany of submissions and can kick your ass to boot. Oh, and it's like, I didn't get my hug from Bailey, by the way, but if you missed me on the show, then the camera mustn't have been pointed anywhere near me because I stand out like a sore thumb in my bright purple shirt up against the guardrail. And... Uh, she ran over to my side, slapped her hand, blah, 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 blah. And then she hugged the guy on the other side of the guardrail. I'm like, God damn it. <laughs> um, but you told me you've hugged her before, so this isn't a bad thing. You when you know Bailey is a hugger. Yes. And um, for some reason, just like intuition, maybe it's supposed to feel like this, when uh, Bailey gets to the ring and Oscar's just staring at her, that was the moment I knew Oscar was winning. Like, she just had that look like, I am going to kill you. By and, the way, quote of the night from the fan in front of me was, don't get me wrong, I like her, but she's got that, I like you, but I could kick your ass and kill you kind of look. Oscar or Bailey? Oscar. Okay. My quote of the night came from the two people sitting in front of me. They took a selfie together, but I made a weird face because I was in the picture, and I made a joke trying to apologize, and they didn't speak a word of English. Oh, no. Yeah, so, parlez-vous français, and that's all I know in French. Um, I, I know French. Marquez Louis, c'est bête le faux. Money! Money! <laughs> um, so, Bailey versus Asuka, this was an excellent match. I think, you know, they probably should have switched Ooh. the match order a little bit there. But, you know, I, I didn't want to accept the finish when it was happening. Like... It was go it was happening, and I was kind of like, "Is that really it?" But it's like, but what happened was uh, after they beat the snot out of each other. There's no better way to say that. Um, Oscar locked on the Oscar lock, the cross face chicken wing, uh, and Bailey reached and grabbed and scratched and clawed for the ropes, and she couldn't quite get there, and she passed out. And the ref called for the bell, and Asuka is your new champion. Asuka made the NXT Women's Division tremble now because, oh boy. <laughs> Maybe we'll finally get that Asuka even rematch. Yeah, if she killed her with death, she would be the most over person in the entire company. Killed her with death. Well, that's like kicking the leg out of your leg. Maybe yeah. rest in peace, Owen. Yes. I, that's actually... A takeoff of the one I use, I say, Ali oh, killed him to death. Mm -hmm. huh? it's, yeah, it's pretty close to that. You're right. Yes. Um, again, like the last three matches, by the way, just go out of your way to see. But Bailey and Asuka, this was a woman's wrestling fight. Mm -hmm. And these two ladies, there's no scratching, there's no clawing, there was grappling. There was brawling. There was a hurricanrana. Um, there was just everything. The, like, the best of both women. Bailey never at any point actually hit the Bailey to belly. She did actually at one point use an ankle lock on Asuka, but Asuka was able to get out of that. Now, speaking of ankles, I want to point out that Bailey did something that I greatly appreciate in any match, men's or women's match. She sold an injury in a convincing manner when. Asuka was working her over and working the leg and she went to the outside and was hopping around on one leg and trying not to stand on the other. Mm -hmm. I was very happy about that because all the way up where I was, I could see her selling. Mm -hmm. And Bailey, she's come a long way 
like not just the character, but her as a worker. And I mean, she was always kind of good, but now she's like, she's reached another level. Like, and it helps in a way that there's no Paige, there's no Charlotte, there's no Sasha, there's no Becky. She's there. She was given the ball to run with it, is what you're saying. And she ran to the end zone. Mm -hmm. I'll be honest, I'm looking forward to Asuka versus Nia Jax. And I'm looking, I'll be honest, I'm looking forward to see what happens next in almost up and down the entire card. And specifically the world heavyweight title picture. I guess not really world title, but you know, the championship picture. Well, I bet the whole world came to Dallas this weekend, so yeah, I could make that argument. There you go. It was Finn Balor, it was Samoa Joe, part two for the NXT championship. And before the entrances, who's sitting in the crowd, but technically current TNA World Tag Team Champion, Bobby Roode. And the crowd marked out for that. They popped. This was the right night to debut him. Well, debut him for lack of a better word, because they all knew who he was. It wasn't... They didn't run the risk of going someplace, you know, with some people who are like, eh, do they watch TNA? Or maybe not watch TNA, but know who he is anyway. Right. Are they aware of him? And this crowd was aware. Yes. And speaking of this crowd, let's just use that as a segue to something that happened very early in the match because within the first 30 seconds, Joe got busted open on something that Finn did, and I'm not quite sure. It may have been an elbow to the face, may have been something else, but he started bleeding. The referee immediately starts to tend to him, and the crowd is upset that the match is being altered for this, and they all start chanting in unison, Fuck PG! Fuck PG. It's like I was saying earlier, I agree with the sentiment. It's never going to change. Mattel pays them way too much money. And while I think, you know, it's kind of overkill to stop the match, to stop the bleeding. Because, I mean, they used to do that, and then they got away from that for a while. So I don't know what, why they started doing it again this time. Like, I know Joe was attempting to wear the crimson mask. They would not let him. Uh, that actually made for some of the best unintentionally planned spots. I mean, you'd think it was worked in the way they were doing it because the rep would come over and wipe it off and Joe would fling it back at his face and the rep would come over again and Joe would shove him away. And this, this turned into fine comedy in yeah. the match. Although, I was... It was hard to get into it because... They kept stopping. Like they stopped it three or four times. And they got the chant every single time they stopped it. And I imagine they probably cut the audio at some point, or at least the crowd audio. And it was just, it was hard. Like, they, they thank God, like, they went about ten minutes there at the end with no stopping, thankfully. Mm -hmm. And that helped save the match. Um... Because of all the frequent stops, it was not as strong of a match as it probably could have been. Um, and at least of the three main events, was the third best or the weakest of the three. Now, again, you said earlier that that's not really a dig. And I got to point out, you're right when you say that. Because the weakest of these three is still a great, excellent match you should go out of yeah. your way to see. Yeah, when you have a three and a half, four star match, and that's the weakest of three matches you could see... That's still a pretty good little uh, show there. Indeed. And I thought, I really believed in my mind that Samoa Joe was winning the NXT title tonight. So I got pleasantly surprised on the finish on the way this match ended. Yep. Finn Balor at one point hit the Coupe de Gras. Joe, actually, no, he didn't even go for the cover. He went for the Bloody Sunday, and Joe got away from that. Joe at one point hit the Muscle Buster. Finn kicked out of that. Joe and, had a very convincing Kakina clutch on for quite a long time. Yes. And it looked like that was it for Balor. Like, it was on tight. It was on good. And that's it. We're, we have a new champion, ladies and gentlemen. And then WrestleMania 8 broke out. It's <laughs> a good way of putting it. Almost 24 years later, almost to the day, Finn Balor ran up the ropes, pushed off the top, threw his legs over, bridged over Joe, the ref counted one, the ref counted two, and yes, ladies and gentlemen, the ref counted three. 
Finn Balor, still your NXT champion. I wonder if that changes the plans for the Balor Club now. See, I honestly thought that, you know, it was going to take place here, that this is when Carl Anderson and Doc Gallows were going to come out, and they were going to form the Balor Club here. And I was horribly wrong. Yes. And And I thought the whole reason for Joe to win tonight was to set up the Balor Club debuting on Raw. And uh, so, really excellent little match. Um, Excellent way to finish the show. Surprised by the finish. Yes, in case you're wondering, in case it made camera, that was me that yelled, that was three in Samoa Joe's face as he's walking (laughs) back up the ramp. Okay, now speaking of things that probably didn't make it or maybe did, at one point when it got dead quiet during Bailey and Asuka, I yelled out, Izzy, what's up? I did not hear that. Yeah, probably didn't make camera then. Yeah. Hey, Mauro Ronaldo did acknowledge me. Oh. Yes, he was doing the pre-show with Lita and, uh, what's her name, Renee Young. And I yelled, uh, you're the best, Mauro. And he turned, gave me a thumbs up, and gave him the thumbs up back. And there's my Mauro and all story of the day. I told you I met him at a Invictus show in Kansas City, didn't I? You did not. Yeah, he was uh, there to do the post-fight press conference and do some announcing duties and other things. And... I just came up to him and said, Marlo, I'm a huge fan of your work. I'd like to shake your hand and tell you that I think you're great, and maybe we can do an interview sometime. And he said, sure, I'll give you my email, and it's Marlo Ronaldo, blah, blah, blah. And he gave me the info, and uh, I never I, did hear back from him after that, but at least I got to shake his hand and tell him he was awesome. I'll be honest for a second. I thought you were about to give Marlo Ronaldo's email. No, <laughs> I, I, ma- I made up something at the end because I wasn't going to give out the real email address. But the point is... I met him, and he was a nice guy, and I w- I'm happy now that all these years later he's doing SmackDown. Yep. I still don't watch SmackDown, but, you know, when that like, every soft one I do, it's like I definitely prefer his commentary over young Michael Coles. I, I prefer his commentary as long as he, uh, funny enough, keeps it PG, because every now and then Morrow will say something really off-color, and I'm wondering if that will come back to bite him on SmackDown. I don't think it will. But in the past, he has said some very, very un-PG things. <laughs> uh, I'm just happy I didn't have to listen to my least favorite commentator in wrestling, Corey Graves. I know I'm the only one who hates him. I accept that. He did and get a nice round of applause when they introduced the announcers at the beginning. I thought we were chanting for Tom Phillips. <laughs> doubt that. I sincerely doubt that. Tom Phillips and his baby blue coats that he wore. And... Like, this was an excellent experience, all things considered. An easy thumbs-up show. If all you do is watch the last 90 minutes, then you've watched a great 90 minutes. And you know what? I would just go ahead and throw American Alpha and the Revival into that as well, because that was a great opener that exceeded my expectations. Mm-hmm. And I want to point out, they did. They not only booed Roman Reigns, because they showed a WrestleMania commercial... They booed Roman Reigns, and they cheered the heck out of Hunter. Mm, While he is NXT, after all, so they're going to love him. Now, by the way, where where the balcony area where I was, you couldn't see the video screen, so Mm -hmm. it looked like there was one over the entrance. Was that the one that you were watching, or was there another one? I know, it was the main entrance Titan Tron area. Mm, Yeah, the only way I could actually see any of the video was if I looked down into my left, I could actually see the video playing on the monitors for the production crew. Ah. Uh, By the way, I want to point out, during Asuka's entrance, I don't know why I found this funny, uh, they dropped, like, little pieces of pink um, paper down. Right, they were giving her, like, the the rose petal dramatic entrance. For some reason, I found this hilarious. As soon as she walked and got, and the camera was away from that ramp, seven or eight guys all ran out with brooms, and you've never seen people sweep up rose petals as so fast in your life. <laughs> in fact, as fast as they were moving, I almost thought it was like when she shed her ring, uh, ring walkout attire, she just threw it off like, screw this, I don't need this anymore. I thought they were running out to sweep that up too. <laughs> By the way, Finn Balor came out with a chainsaw. 
<laughs> I guess Dean Ambrose went to visit him. I guess so. Or uh, just, it's, it's another visual representation of how dark and uh, brooding and evil he can be. Yeah. They bring out this chainsaw. They set it down there before Vin makes his entrance. And I'm like, why the heck did they give him a chainsaw? And you know, that just reminds me of one thing that bugged me about the Elias Sampson match. This always bugs me when I'm at a live match and I can see things that the camera doesn't show you when you watch. Mm -hmm. Seeing the guitar sitting in plain sight in the ring, like, for an object, move that. Like, it's clearly in harm's way. Several times, Apollo Crews and Elias Sampson almost unintentionally stepped on it or, or ran into it. Like... I know it was there in case they needed it for a weapon shot, but the very fact that you know that's why it's there kind of blows the kayfabe of the whole thing. Yep. Uh, so that was TakeOver, an easy thumbs up for me. Definitely. I have no objections to the show. Wish Austin Aries had gone over a little stronger. I wish his match had been a little better, but still he got the win, and everything else I was okay with, and the last three matches were all great. Yes. See, I wasn't uh, sure if they were going to, uh, if Aries was going to run the Brain Buster, if this is the 450 or what, but nope, he is none of the above. Well, I guess they're saving that for later, maybe with a better opponent. When you can give a Brain Buster to someone, you know, smaller. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying he probably couldn't give it to Baron, but yeah. You know what? You could might as well just do that with, uh, say, give him a feud with Andrage and let them do that kind of stuff. So, can't speak for Stevie J here, but I will be back on uh, late Sunday night, early Monday morning with Wrestle Freaking Mania. I may just let you run with that and put that up because I think I'll be too wiped out. I'll be honest, my hotel's Wi Fi really, really bites. So, I don't know if Stevie's going to get this up, but you may not hear that WrestleMania audio until Tuesday. If so, I apologize greatly. But uh, either way, I'll be back. Stevie is going to be back at some point, I'm sure. Indeed. T take an Uber to Starbucks. <laughs> Uber sucks. <laughs> All right. So for Emerson Wittner and for myself, Stevie J, and for our respective homes, AngryMarks.com and WrestlingOutsiders.com, thank you for listening to our post-NXT takeover live from Dallas, Texas. Adios. You're listening to the Angry Marks Podcast Network.